Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very, very first session of Europe Voices of Women in Film, uh, which would usually take place now in Sydney. Uh, my name is Sonja Heinen. I'm the Managing Director of EFP, uh, that's European Film Promotion, and we are actually an international network organization of all the national film promotion institutes from throughout Europe. So 37 countries participate in EFP. They send us the best of their talent and their films, and we go out into the world to promote it internationally. So here with us are nine of the 10 women who have made a film which were, was selected for our program at Sydney. Uh, I would like to thank you all for participating um, in the session and for talking with us about your films. I would like to thank the Sydney Film Festival for uh, the partnership with us, which we are doing since 2016, with great women directors presenting absolutely exciting films. And I would like to thank Creative Europe, the media program, without whom we couldn't do that uh, program at all. And of course, also Uri Marsch, who is our longstanding partner in this. And since last year, we are partnering with the EVA Network, European Women's Audiovisual Network, and which is a wonderful collaboration. And I would like to introduce to you Tamara Tatishvili, uh, who is doing the, strategic, uh, the strategics for um, uh, the network. And Tamara will take over the session. And with us, before uh, I give over to you, Tamara, I would like to introduce Andreas Struck. Andreas is the project director from EFP for Sydney. And Jo Milberger, who is also with us, is our deputy managing director. And I leave Tamara with the moderation and to introduce the films and the wonderful directors behind. Thank you very much, Sonia. And hello, everyone. Uh, as said, my name is Tamara. I represent European Women's Audiovisual Network, and it is a total pleasure to be in this partnership with the organizations that have been already mentioned. So I will not repeat what Sonia has said, but for the second year, we do feel very lucky that we can have this joint events with EFP, collaborate with Sonia, Jo, and Andreas, whom we know is brilliant on organizing this project and we would be very happy to keep in touch with you and tell you a bit more about um, EWA. So um, let me maybe give you a short overview of what is the idea today. Um, as a representative of EWA Network, you obviously all understand that it's European Women's Audiovisual Network, which means that it supports empowerment of female talent. EWA Network exists since year 2013 and acts in different directions in order to support its membership. As a membership organization, it acts in direction of advocacy for gender equality, but it is also a much more practical organization and offers the activities that are specific for different kinds of talent. So one of the flagship activities is producers mentoring program, for instance, that runs over one year and helps young producers to be mentored by those that are already successful in their job on European stage. Uh, there is also a residency for writers. There are a lot of uh, advocacy works in Brussels, but also internationally in order to boost the gender uh, representation. And uh, we are quite um, strongly present in virtual reality. Way before COVID outbreak, we had a lot of online events because not everyone can have to have an access to different labs festivals because we do know that those uh, travels cost and not everyone is always selected to be part of the exclusive groups. So there's a lot of activities for members online that is about accelerating talent, getting access to financing, so on and so forth. Uh, why this event is so interesting for us and why for me personally, I do love doing it because I think something that is very important is to look at things from a perspective that you don't necessarily embark on by your original feeling or by the reality in which you are rooted. And I think probably this is what the team of EFP, but also other partners and the festival itself wanted to discuss when 
we've been coming up with this idea of how to navigate a cultural boundaries and tell your own stories. Now, I'm very far away from the thought that all of you have one thematic understanding of cultural boundaries and how you navigate your own ambition, your own artistic vision. But after reading a bit about some of you, knowing some of you before and watching the films, uh, I did feel that it's just so wonderful that there is such a pool of talent, like literally an army of female talent that is helping the process of putting in practice what gender equality agenda really means. Because sometimes you end up in an event and you only talk about statistics. And don't misunderstand me, I don't say that 50-50 doesn't matter, it does matter a lot. But what matters probably even more is like shifting the narrative, is to trying to look at things from a different perspective, but also understanding and respecting where is the culture that this story is coming from and how are we looking at things. Are we victimizing? Are we maybe falling into some stereotypes or bias without knowing or sometimes even knowing because it's way easier that way because we're used to it. And these films with its power, sometimes with its immense strength, sometimes in a more tender way, they do help us understand how to shift sometimes our own thinking how to shift the narrative and how to be daring even as an audience. So I would just like to thank you all for being so great in doing what you're doing, because finally I'm a human being like all of us. And at some point last year, I just hated sitting in front of my computer and attending online premieres or having a pleasure of, you know, moderating a premiere or inviting talent to a Q&A, at some point I thought, why am I still doing it? Why am I opening this computer and one day I'm in one country and another in another country? And I understood that it's only the stories that move, that attract, that still somehow affect us very powerfully. And these stories elicit deep feelings and they help us to navigate a little bit in our own lives. And I think that in one way or another, some people will love them, others will criticize it. That's why cinema exists. But you have all really helped me make those hours so meaningful. And I'm super happy that at least virtually I'm going to meet you almost all nine out of 10 filmmakers today. And then at some point, I'm sure that in this crazy industry that we are operating in, we will also probably at some point cheer in person in a festival in coming years. So let's see how um, each of you look at the cultural boundaries, how much you need to push them in order to uh, say what you want to say in your visual narrative and how much how easy it is, and if not, how, how you're overcoming the challenges. And I would like to go to a country that I'm spying a bit behind for some years. And I'm looking here at Blerta, uh, who has done the film uh, Hive. I, I assume that some of you maybe have seen the films of selected in the programs, others not. But Blerta is coming from Kosovo, right, Blerta? And, uh, you are in Kosovo right now, I assume. And what's happening in that country in terms of pushing the boundaries and having this powerhouse female talent that each of them have a film in A-list festival. And not only that, whatever comes out of Kosovo mostly is like really shaking the industry in one way or another. And let me tell you, with my background in film policies and to some sort of international cooperation. I do know that there's a lot to be done and it's not easy to, to promote and to put a spotlight on low production capacity countries, as we say. But I was very impressed, Blerta, by, by your work um, in the film Hype, of which you will tell us a bit probably and maybe also mention which countries have co-produced it. Because to me, in short, and I'm not here to tell the stories because people will watch the films, it's a detailed account of female empowerment. 
Unfortunately, it's a film that is based on true events. It comes out of the war history that your country and the region has, but it has so much power and you are telling us the story of your main hero who's female um, and who is uh, finally very successful as a businesswoman, as a mother and as an individual person who broke out of the stereotypes in one way or another. So could you tell us a bit about the process of identifying this story and how challenging it was to actually bring it to the screen? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, you know, in terms of like uh, women filmmakers and the industry and the films that are um, happening here, um, it is partially because um, the Cinematography Center decided to open the doors to um, younger filmmakers um, because it used to be only older filmmakers who had a chance to do uh, films and then um, at some point they decided that we need to hear younger voices. I'm not so young anymore but <laughs> at least it happened. I'm a little bit younger than, uh, than those who used to make films um, and luckily I mean we do have a lot of women filmmakers and I can say that almost each of them made, made wonderful uh, film. So um, in terms of being a woman filmmakers, I didn't have to push much boundaries because they were pushed by my colleagues. And in a way, I do see the success of all the films of um, a sacrifice, uh, a little bit of the, all the artists and uh, love and passion and enthusiasm, because although it's a um, country with not I can say like maybe low budget films is like ultra low budget films uh, that uh, are produced here, but then uh, with the hard work of every filmmaker, there are films being made. And as you said, almost every film is going to an A-list film festival. Only this year we had, uh, we've been in many, many festivals, uh, starting from Sundance to Rotterdam. And um, now we'll have in Venice, Locarno, Cannes, um, uh, everywhere. So it's a little bit like we're a little bit surprised with uh, all the results, but we shouldn't be because it's been uh, at least in the last 10 years, um, a lot of beautiful films have been made. And a little bit, I think it happened because uh, once a filmmaker, uh, which is a woman again, like Vlieta Zaciri, went to Sundance with a short film, then it, it kind of, um, I think it kind of brought the belief that even coming from a small country like Kosovo and making these very low budget films, you can still make it uh, and have your film shown to bigger audiences and, and have the film have a bigger bigger journey than, than only showing it in Kosovo. So I think of them after film and kind of seeing your colleagues work so passionately, um, it was kind of a, a way of inspiring each other and working with each other that made all these films um, successful. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. And I think uh, all my EFP colleagues will agree that uh, Arben is doing a great job at the Kosovo Film Center. And it's great that he's um, opening up um, to a younger generation. But what is paradoxical, and I do think that you are still pushing the boundary quite, quite well, is that on one hand, you're telling the story how your industry is um, mobilizing, which is great. And on the other hand, in your film, we do see that the Ferrier, right, your, your, your main actress actually really needs to push a strong mile in order to get an access to the decision to, to ride a car and to make her own small business in order to, to, to feed her family, literally, but in a way just to become a strong individual, whatever gender, just to be able to take care of herself and her loved ones. And then she's also pushing all the others behind herself, right? The others that do not want to cross the line because they will be criticized. So in one way or another, I do believe that there is this layer of complexity still, and it's great that you are telling those stories and bringing them to international audiences. I mean, yes, um, definitely. I mean, it is quite, I mean, life is paradoxical in many ways. Um, and I think uh, some things do uh, move on faster than others. Um, and, and then it becomes a, this, this balance of having so many um, 
let's say so many women in filmmaking who uh, can who and what made it like it's very normal in Kosovo to be a woman filmmaker at least as long as we have low budget films um, a colleague of mine was like let's wait and see when we have big budget films if there are going to be a lot of women or they're still going to try and trust that money to um, to men uh, directors but we're not going to be so quiet <laughs> if that happens uh, but at the same time yes it's a pit it's a patriarchal society uh, and for me I live I, I was born and raised in Pristina and I lived only for a couple of years in New York but then I came back here um so I spent mo all my life here and even for me it was a little bit surprising although we do face um, patriarchy in every, in our in, even in my everyday life uh, but at the same time, I think I'm in a better position. Uh, so for me, it felt like I do like um, uh, saying the truth and I do like being honest of things happening around me. Although, um, although sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes I wasn't aware that they're to, to that level. Um, so even for me, hearing, hearing Fahri's story was a little bit Hmm, but yes, we are known for uh, a very uh, for good hospitality. We really like people coming to our country. We are really known for solidarity because we did help each other uh, when the war happened or before the war. I mean, whoever went to West to work, they would send money back to Kosovo. So we were kind of known for supporting each other. And then, and then when this woman wants to get a driving license and work, um, I would just, my answer would be, what would the rest do would be that, that the whole village would just help her. I mean, that would be my, my answer coming from here. And then we do, uh, we do see people prejudicing her and, you know, film has to be um as long as it has to be you have to focus the story but uh, many more things happen to her and i think i could make um, many more films uh, about Fahriye. but just meeting i mean for me the inspiration i heard the story i was surprised i was sad uh, that that uh, that she had to go through that also besides losing her husband and having to look for him even today she hasn't found her husband and she still had to deal with society and as you said, even um, even if it came from men, but also a little bit from women, because they some of them did not want to join her, and some of them also um, were against her, uh, you know, in one way or another. So I mean, she had to uh, make this all happen, and carrying her pain within herself, and having to take care of two two children. I do have two children, and I think even today it's very hard to raise them. And I couldn't imagine, uh, or I can try to imagine, how has it been for her uh, dealing with all that pain and all prejudice. But um, in a way, if you ever have a chance to meet Fahri or see a video of her talking, then you know that oh, she could do it because she's a uh, she's just such an inspiring character and 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 really. She that's, inspired that's, me and I learned so much that's from inspiring, her. Inspiring, as you said, but not to give away too much of the of the spoiler and to let people and the audience watch the films. I think it's really something that sometimes people don't understand on a paper when you advocate for a cause, but when you see the film and the transformation of your character, then you understand how important this agenda is and that it's really is changing lives with culture within a cultural traditional context and beyond so i wish you wonderful continuation of uh, ex exploring the different uh, angles to to her character and many others i'm sure you have and let me now move maybe not too far away i'm looking at you maria um, because uh, the documentary film called reconciliation is a co-production between Slovenia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Kosovo, right? And here in that film, we are somehow traveling to contemporary Albania, right? And then uh, we are looking at something that is, uh, shortly speaking, a tradition of taking the blood. Uh, to me, uh, in, I come from Georgia, Georgia the country, as you probably all understood, and not the US, and something the things that I'm seeing in, in this work, I do understand them fairly easily. I, I, I see the context, I, I know this kind of tradition and then also the societal and the pain of a societal change happening also in Caucasian context, not only in the context which you're showing, 
But I sometimes still have a feeling if this kind of realities, if international audiences are ready, if they are interested to watch that, is that something that is appealing or not? And I know that it might be a bit of a challenging uh, early to take, but tell us, Maria, how did you end up doing this, you know, this documentary chronicle and why you went to, to that country? Because you're not from there, right? Yeah. Firstly, hello, I'm actually not far away. I'm in Prizren, Kosovo right now, where we are premiering our, we have a Kosovo premiere of our documentary within the Doko Fest Film Festival, um, a very familiar festival in the region. Um, I am not sure if I can answer the question about the interests of the industry or the audiences, that's up to the audiences to decide. Um, as to the topic of the film, I think it's, um, to, to me, it was a complex topic because it is set in modern day. It's very easy to oversimplify this issue, as in saying that, you know, there is an old tradition that's persisting to the present day, uh, but that's not the case. Albania had a very complex history. Um, it was under communism for 50 years, during which old, old traditions along with religion were suppressed. And um, during the 90s, when um, one system fell and the new democratic system was not trusted yet, that's when some revival of, of the past started to happen. And in some cases, it was just um, misinterpreted, mm, abused even, um, as you can see, there is a protagonist in the film that I think um, maneuvers between different value systems, religion on the one hand, and some kind of an attempt of a revival of the past, of, of the old traditions on the other. Um, so I saw this as an, something that did not seem as something that's very far away from me. Um, this kind of... Um, revival of tradition, misinterpreted again, of, of old values, I would say, something that was going on in Europe as I started to make this film. In our case, um, by the, um, I would say, populist far-right movements that started to bring forth, you know, going back into our national pasts or relying into onto our national religions or trying to revive these patriarchal um, modes of, of living that uh, are said to exist once. And I actually saw a lot of parallels between that situation and the situation of Albania in the 90s when this, this started to happen. So if you have a lot of large numbers of disenfranchised people who are looking for a solution, for solutions for very modern problems, um, then you can start um, to sell them these uh, um, I would say old solutions for modern problems. Not that this exact, that's how it happened. That's not exactly how it happened in Albania. In mid nineties, the country was in, at a brink of almost a civil war due to, due to the collapse of a large number of pyramids, pyramid schemes. So you can see this setting, you know, of, of kind of um, um, lawlessness in a way where you can start filling in uh, this void with various value systems, none of which function properly. And I saw something similar happening. I have a background in sociology. Maybe that's why I also try to see things from a bigger picture before I enter into a personal story, which um, this film is. It's a very, very personal story about loss, forgiveness, um, um, and how can you let go of something from the past? And that's, that's something as a topic that appealed to me. And of course, um, um, filmmakers like Blerta from Kosovo and, and a, large, a large number of young um, filmmakers from Kosovo, and I'm, I'm sure Albanian filmmakers will join them as well are dealing with some similar topics and, uh, and some very own treatments because this particular topic might be, I wouldn't say exotic, but not necessarily 
incredibly familiar even to some Albanians. I was filming in very, very remote areas and I wanted to show this topic on a personal level, but also more complex as it used to be treated. So, um, yeah. And uh, you've mentioned your background and if I just may add which personal uh, notes somehow, I think it, your, when other people will see your films, you can see with this title that you're very passionate to tell these social stories, but there is also a very delicate account, you know, of facts and tradition. And I would like to congratulate you on that because that's not an easy thing to achieve and even more so in, um, in historic context, which is so complex. So if I may just add a short note, when you talked about limitations, I would just like to point out something that I think started to happen to women filmmakers. And it's this notion that um, a female perspective is just a perspective that focuses on female characters. And while I do think that that is incredibly important to bring a larger variety and complex uh, women, female characters into focus, um, um, it's something that's also can be incredibly limiting for women filmmakers, just as we started to enter filmmaker filmmaking into in greater numbers. And that's some feedback that we got as we started um, um, how to say, launching it into the um, industry, into the market from um, market professionals that, you know, while women filmmakers and uh, female perspective is on trend right now, this may not be it because it focuses too much on male characters. Um, and also the second thing I would like to pick up, on, pick up on Blair Tattoo, which is the budgets. And these are very important. We all know that from the statistics, European women filmmakers have been joining documentary filmmaking in larger numbers than feature films, where we all know that first of all, a filmmaker has to wear many hats. And second of all, the budgets are much lower. So that's maybe something to consider. Absolutely, and thank you very much for being so specific on, on that because I, I'm trying to, to keep the focus on, on the films and on this program and I, I thought commenting on the issue of fine access to finance and the budgets that both of you have voiced later on because we, we risk opening up the gender agenda in this conversation because you are all opinionative and knowledgeable and I would very much like to invite you to do that maybe in another actions that our network does but absolutely getting access to the big budgets is one of the pillars and it's me personally with my whole career if I've ever done something in this industry and also many of my colleagues working across um, the equality agenda it, having a female perspective is not like eliminating a group of women that need to tell stories to each other and be happy with that. I'm sure that now in a couple of minutes there will be people taking up the floor and talking about the films they've done, how they've challenged also the perspective and the female gaze and I'm actually looking at some of you but on Zoom you don't know whom uh, but uh, it's about having equal access to everything and celebrating your talent with the equal financing that is available historically, mostly to, to male talent and many other elements that are on content. It's about bias, it's about perspective, whose who story we're telling and so on. But as you've mentioned, uh, European filmmakers, let's say, and probably more like Western European, where the structures are more stable and the, the continuation of funding is also a bit more elaborate. I'll, I'll move to France and I would like to invite Chalene into the, into the conversation. I think we are naturally evolving different angles that exist, uh, that female talent reflects on in their um, works. And in your film that is titled Slalom, right? Um, which was also the uh, can labeled selection 2020. Um, in, uh, in brief, for me, this is a film that is such a, um, such a powerful story of resilience of a, of a, of a child. And it's also uh, emancipation, it's coming of age. It's set in this rather harsh, um, 
you know, power playing reality of the high performance sports. And you have this never ending and probably we will never find a black and white solution of relationship between the, the, the trainer and the talent and what happens with the affection, with abuse, with passion. Um, and what struck me quite strongly, Shalane, is that you are really bringing up the complexity of these matters. It's not only about the sexual abuse and it's not like, you know, the, the account of the report, but it's you're showing how complicated that setup is. And I assume you know that setup pretty well because you yourself been doing some of that in your previous life, right? Before you came to, to cinema. So could you tell us a bit more about your, uh, your film and how did, why did you decide to, to tell that story of your young character? And uh, was it pushed by any movement uh, that we recently know, for instance, being it Me Too or anything else that followed? Or did you work a, around the subject matter way before? Yeah, that's a, a big question and a yes. big subject. But um, no, actually it was not an answer of a movement to, to make this film because I started the writing in 2014. So it took me five years to, to make this film and to, fi and to finance the film and because nobody wanted to hear about that uh, before Me Too. And probably it happens because Me Too unblocked, unlocked something. And helped me to to make it happen but uh, it was really a need from uh, from my inner uh, needs uh, to make this film uh, it was really important for me to to become a free woman to free myself from the story um, and it was quite a, a process quite uh, unconscious uh, inconscient uh, um, um, I didn't, unconscious, yeah. Unconscious. I, I didn't really realize what I was writing while I was writing the script, actually. I had some really big ideas of the mountain where I grew up, uh, the, the sport, probably the abuse, but that was really under the skin of uh, all the rest of the elements of the film. So it took me um, a long time as well to reveal the the point of the film. Um, yes, of course, it was really important for me to to point the the complexity of the situation because uh, I realized that uh, we didn't talk about that before me too. There were no voice or or really small voice. Um, I realized. We didn't talk about that because it was complicated to talk about, and um, 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 that's why I made this film. I made this film to show the world that yes, it can be complicated. Is it complicated? But we can explain what happened by um, telling this story from the the feelings of the character. So that that was really my mission of this film to to focus on on Liz, on to tell the story from her point of view to, to performance, like you enter in her body, in her mind, and you just follow her in, in this crazy adventure, um, sometimes good and sometimes bad as well. Um, uh, I wanted to show everything so we can feel all the journey with uh, avoiding nothing of, uh, of uh, what she experiences. Um, in, in, in our journey there in the ski field with a, with a trainer. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, I think you've achieved a lot of what you're, what you're saying and that's, that's great. And uh, as you said, the complexity, you need to approach it with peeling a layer a bit, probably one by one, because if you don't understand tiny little details for which you account very well in the film, then the complexity doesn't land on your, on your screen or on your, within your understanding straight away. So that's, that's probably why this sort of stories and the perspectives need to exist to, to make us think differently and look at things differently, at least try to do it. Because normally, as, as we all know, our mind tries to initially uh, reject 
and a drastic change in the perception. So that's, that's, that's very helpful. And from, uh, from this angle, I think I would like to invite Eline, who is in uh, Berlin right now, right? And who has done a fantastic film titled Nico. It's, it's a German movie and it is, um, it's, um, you, you'll tell us about the film, but what resonated with me a lot was the story of the nurse that is such a wonderful character. I don't know how you could, how did you manage to have this burning energy and love for life on your screen and then putting us, the audience, on the story of trauma and healing and, you know, achieving all of it on screen. That's quite great. So congratulations on that. But um, there is one way complicated element to which some professionals think that gender agenda and cultural boundaries expanding. Others think that it's an independently existing issue, which is a diversity and inclusion. And I think that you have, the, you resonate this in your film and especially with this hate crime, which happens to your, to your character and then how she needs to overcome it and find her strengths and resilience and come back to society. And that happens through sports as well. So there are a lot of little lines. If you see your films in, in a package, they are very different, but there are some lines that give you like a beautiful little knitted painting. So, so, and, so tell us a bit about your film, maybe Eileen and afterwards, I'm interested, how did you work with your producer who is actually an actress as well, is that so? So that's also quite a internal cultural cooperation that you achieved quite well. So, so what's, how did this all happen? How does this, how did the story come together? Hi everyone, uh, thanks for possibly participate here. Um, there were a lot of questions now. I'm, uh, I have to think, what do I answer first? Um, so I start with Sara Fazilat, uh, that is a producer and a main actor. And uh, we started in film school in the same year. And she came very uh, quickly to me and said, hey, Eileen, um, uh, I think maybe it's a match. Let's do a film together. And I was um, very happy because I thought it too. So we started to um, to to always ne next to our projects. She had a few, I had a few. Uh, we started to film a little bit and develop um, slowly a script um, without knowing that it will be our first feature after eight, eight years later. And this is what Nico became because after... Um, yeah, after some years of developing, we thought, okay, it will be a big film, and it's uh, it's too important for us to make this film um, than having a little project here next to our other projects. Yes, and uh, this is uh, what happened. The film is about um, a nurse, as you said, because my mom is a nurse, so um, she sometimes took me to her patients and I had a lot um, in my memories how to direct it also in a, uh, in a way that it's not about um, being a nurse, more about um, what, what, what in this métier is characterizing a, a main character. And I think, you can put so many characterizing aspects in just one scene and you told everything about this person. So this was uh, one pragmatic way and also because I could um, work a lot with, with this material, with part of my memories. Um, and this, uh, this nurse um, um, gets to um, a racist, uh, how do you say uh, in English, like uh, an attack. And after this attack, she uh, finds herself um, being faced um, with re reality that maybe she was not um, a part of, of this country as she thought she is, of course. So, um, and because um, Sarah and I, for both of us, it was very important to not um, make a film about a, like the victim female, 
um, person, uh, she, uh, the, uh, and the empowerment was the most um, important um, motivation to do this film. Um, so we used sports, <laughs> as you said. Um, maybe you help me out with another question or... No, actually that's you've, uh, I want, I, I brought it in broad because you have a broad approach. You have uh, within that uh, duration of your film, we do see uh, different issues such as hate, crime and discrimination, as you, as you mentioned, then belonging to the society. Um, that's something... Uh, that's another lens how you look at things but the most importantly which almost all of your films have in common is the female empowerment and I don't know if this has been one of the uh, selecting criteria or if it blends and is diffused so naturally in this selection because in one way or another I do understand that sometimes it's a very conscious and a strong decision and sometimes it evolves with the script writing as some of other colleagues said all of these um, women where women are on the front line of the stories do 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 change get more empowered that get their life in their hands somehow and there is one word you've mentioned, Aline, um, it was victimizing. And I think that's also a perspective that some of you here in this program are challenging very strongly. So um, really your film resonates um, also towards the diversity and inclusion agenda because it's not only the story of the nurse, but it's also something that happens to many people next to us in the cities where we live. And that's something that our industry uh, right now is starting to discuss very, very seriously, I believe. Uh, as time is ticking, I need to move to another filmmaker um, whose, um, whose film is also can uh, label 2020, um, Ninja from, from Sweden. Um, I, that you, I mean, I could have probably an hours of q and is with all of you because I'm, I'm really enjoying it. But if I, uh, Pleasure's been a film that was very much anticipated. Um, I also know from, let's say, Swedish and Nordic context, the ones I, and there is, if something is staying with me is the power dynamics, is the, is the gaze and also putting the the film is set, as you all know, obviously, in the porn uh, industry. And the way Ninja looks, makes us look at what happens in that industry is, I think, is absolutely remarkable. Because you can get into a trap literally in every scene, maybe in every second scene, and either stereotype or feel like victimizing. And the way you have achieved it, Ninja, is is incredibly interesting. And I felt so uh, alarmed, to be honest, watching it. You know, it was like full of power. Obviously, the film is very direct. It's very, you know, it is what it is. Like you are within the industry and you see things sometimes the way you maybe don't want to. And that's great. So tell me, how, how was this film received locally, let's say? because I would assume that there have been some different opinions probably. And um, from where does such a strong interest come to, to set the film in, in this subculture and sub-industry of porn? Um, so when you say locally, do you mean in Sweden or? Yes. In... Okay. Uh, it hasn't actually been uh, released yet. In um, uh, It's going to premiere in uh, like three weeks from now. So okay. it's only been uh, screened at um, or showed at the um, Gothenburg Film Festival in, in January, uh, like an online festival. So uh, I'm still waiting for, for the audience's uh, reaction to it. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, and your second question was, oh, the, the reason, the interests. I, mean, I think um, I, since I started making films and even before that, I've always been very interested in the male gaze or like how media images uh, affects our identities or especially like 
as a woman, how my identity is shaped uh, by uh, cultural images. And um, so, yes, yeah, so then I became really interested early in the male gaze and I wanted to question it. Uh, and then uh, I think like placing the story in, in the porn industry is the best place to, if you really want to um, show the male gaze, but also uh, make a point with like reversing it um, because it's really the male gaze taken into its most extreme form. Uh, but you've so, done the gender studies, if I'm not wrong, right? Yes. So you're looking on things where you're putting your, you know, how is camera saying things and how you are actually making your characters take your their decisions and being absolutely in hold of what the the next action is and i think that is also very much changing the perspective on things if you would agree to that yeah i think the perspective has been the like key word um that it's from the female perspective so put, take the position of being the sexual object like the, the woman in the porn film is the most sexualized object or uh, like the, uh, sexualized or objectify as you can be and then placing making her the protagonist and making the audience be with her and see it from her perspective uh, was the point uh, and um, because that's I think that's really interesting and it's also really important when we talk about being women because we live in a man's world and then um, our identities are somehow shaped by men so we are also seeing ourselves we're so good at seeing ourselves from with the eye like from the outside and then um, we have a, like this internalized male gaze which i think well, i find that very interesting that process of um you know shifting like where where who is actually looking at who um and um yeah um and um Sorry, I forgot your second question. No, it was, it was just one question which you have yeah. answered well. And I was just thinking now out loud, uh, when people talk about the female gaze and non-objectivizing women and putting them into the active role, I think there is a film pleasure that is actually an example, like a contemporary example. How What does that really mean? And it's not only for not like for a little club of people who want to advocate for a cause, but it's just a great film that really puts things in the perspective. So whether we like it or not, that's a different story, but it does exist and it's possible to be done. So congratulations again, Inja, and good luck with the, with the release. Um, you obviously already had a strong festival circuit and um, you probably know so much and get, got inspired with all those years of working that I'm sure that there should be some uh, other powerful stories boiling in your mind in one way or another. Is that so? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Very good. Um, I would like to move to, um, to Greece. Uh, or let's say uh, Angeliki, uh, I, if I understand it well, it, you live between Germany and Greece. It's a country that is my forever favorite, probably maybe because Georgians and Greek are same chaotic and outspoken and, you know, share many other flaws as well. But um, your uh, um, I know about some other films that you've done and we... Um, I think that something that is very interesting before we go to the Green Sea, that is the title presented here in, in this program, I think something happens with the perspective when you start living in another country or if you go from one country to another and probably at some point you start to question where do you really belong or if there is any priority line. So. Uh, I was wondering if this story um, of woman suffering from amnesia that is in Green Sea and then uh, having this wonderful setting that is so perfect of her 
cooking in this tavern where she has no memory, but she has this skill, she has this sense. It's, it's, it's quite wonderful actually. And then all the rest that happens without, without accounting for the details because audiences will watch it, how she, she finds herself and starts her life again. I wonder, does your own life somehow professional and the questions that come up in your professional past have influenced putting all that in the character of your film? Or maybe not. How did you come up with this idea? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Eh? Yes. Um, the, the, the story is, uh, OK, I will say why, first, why I wanted to make this film. All my previous films were very, very hard, I can say. The, the, you know, Edward was a prison film almost. It was the portrayal of a, a killer, yes. Uh, Donusa was uh, incest, you know. Uh, Nights Games Away it was uh, um, uh, female gambling, yeah. And this, all these films were very hard in a way, so strong films, very hard. And there came a time where I wanted, when Greece was in financial crisis, you know. I had the feeling, uh, and because my previous films were mixed, always German, Greek, you know, mixed uh, stories, uh, German actors, uh, Greek actors, you know, I wanted to make a film with hope and um, with light, let's say so. And this is the, the story is, is inspired by um, a book, by a novel of a, a acclaimed uh, Greek writer. Uh, the title is To See the Sea. And I love the idea that a woman who has no memory can cook. And in that uh, uh, case is able to bring people together and she joins the people together. She creates a bond and all these people are lonely and she's lonely, you know, and all of us are lonely today because we are in our, uh, in our um, apartments and we are lonely, you know, and this woman brings all these people together with her cooking art, but the film is not uh, about cooking, it's much more than this. Uh, but I really had the need to make something with a light at the end of the tunnel. I was tired of my previous films that they were so hard and so, you know, um, that's the reason. And anyway, I must say something. I have, made, I, I have made different films, many films, yes, but I thought one says the directors make always the same film. They change the story, but they make the same film. And, and I thought I always have a woman or a man that comes somewhere in a foreign environment. And then I come to the point what you mentioned, you know, I'm a foreign. I mean, I came from Greece. I studied in Germany, yes. And so I had the first shock was the cultural shock, you know, a south uh, from the south to the central Europe. Yes, it was a cultural shock. Um, and anyway, I mean, I, 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 I found myself in a foreign, a strange uh, foreign environment. Always my stories is somebody who arrives somewhere, yes, and it's a catalyst for himself and for the environment. She or he appears. And I thought, oh, after the trilogy I had, eh, it's over. But no, it's not over. I mean, I just see that it's the same with um, uh, Green Sea. A woman comes and is catalyst for this environment and for herself as well. Uh, Angelica, that's that's great. And actually, I I was thinking uh, to ask you about this uh, quite a radical difference to to the to your previous films. And if we if we go a bit self ironic, and I think we can because this conversation is informal and it's about talent and cinema. Uh, there's so much talk about uh, female talent not making uh, genre movies and uh, you know this criminal record and so on and you've done all those you know you've you've played a lot let's say with all sorts of the genre in your previous uh, films and now as you as you explained well we are in this um, more let's say a tender setup when things uh, evolve in in a different way so you have also somehow challenged your own way of uh, 
filming and identifying the stories that you you wanted to tell so I, I find it very interesting and I think it's really really great to see how how different uh, films of one singular talent can be so that's do you know something? At the same time, all these years, I shot at the same time a documentary on the streets of Athens, you know, about stray dogs. And um, I, 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 I did uh, at the same time these two films. I mean, every film takes uh, seven years in order to be done. But I thought it is good to change and not to be cliche, you know. Uh, you know, many people, when you make one film, the second film, uh, they expect that you make the whole, the, the, the next uh, serious drama or very heavy film. And, and I thought, no, I, I, I want to change and I want to make the film I have to need to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't care what uh, other people expect from me. And I think food, because all people in the whole world, you know, there is a basic because you, you, you talked about boundaries. I think all people have, have memories from their childhood, from the grandmother, from the mother, you know, you from the Georgian kitchen, me from the uh, Greek uh, kitchen and the French kids and the friends, you know, and all the people recall their memories from the past when they eat something uh, traditional. And I think it is, it is um, every audience can understand this film, but at the same time, I decided for something which was not very easy. It was the form of the film. I decided about less is more. And that is a new way that I worked by this film. I mean, by the previous films, I was moving the camera, you know, it was very, um, uh, you know, very pussy. And here I decided to work in another way. But okay, that's all what I wanted to say about the film. I, I yes, I, I totally hear you. And one of the missions, uh, I think, and I'm looking at my colleagues from European Film Promotion is to actually attract audiences to the films and make them understand what to expect. And I think it's like real strong menu here with, that could uh, cater for all sorts of uh, um, yeah, taste lovers in cinema, let's say. And I would um, move to, um, to Madrid or close near Madrid, at least within the within the film context. Isabel, it's a pleasure to meet you here on Zoom. Um, and uh, the film, The Last Days of Spring that you present is a co-production between Netherlands and Spain. Um, and it's, um, it's something that, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful and very touching and to some extent very painful story as well of how, uh, um, we need to play with the word of boundaries is actually really pushing your own boundary of the family uh, in this city that you tell us about in Spain, that they are forced to leave the house that they even built themselves, right, with their own hands. And then what was whole, you know, with this whole deconstruction and reconstruction and the, the, the feeling that's, that's and the pain that is accompanying the process. So, I think it was uh, it's um, it's extremely interesting and very very cinematic what you have done, so con congratulations on that and maybe maybe tell tell me something I've made a bit of a research on, on all of you of course in one way or another out of curiosity and uh, in in one of your um, in 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 one of your versions of the interest cinematic interest there is this line. Uh, that you are in, you are finding cinema of in betweenness, which is uh, combining reality and fiction. And I think that this film very much echoes what what you're trying to say also in that sentence. So tell your colleagues and tell us about the film and whether there is an reality element to to that story or not. Is it something that has happened or happening? or could happen, I let you explain the rest. Yes, thank you for inviting me here. Um, well, actually what we did what, with this film was, was for me very uh, new and interesting as well, um, because we normally you, uh, in film you recreate uh, the past, uh, something that has happened, you, you recreate, but what we did with this film is we recreated the future um, so 
um, this family um, and this place where the family lives in a, in a slum uh, near Madrid, uh, it's, it's real. They lived there their whole lives for 18 years. I've met the family uh, five years prior of, to making this film because I made a short um, with two of the youngest brothers of the family. And uh, we always stayed in touch. Uh, I'm half Spanish. So that's also, I think, an interesting side note when we're talking about this notion of, of bridging between two cultures. Um, so um, I, I visit Spain every year to see my family. Uh, and I made this, this uh, I, I ended up after visiting my family, also visiting this family. Um, and at one of those, those visits, they told me um, the land they were living on, it was illegal land, uh, it was been sold and they were going to be evicted. Um, for me, this was a very uh, strong notion. And, and from that point on, uh, knowing they were going to lose their, their not only their home, but this, this, their own way of life, because they are uh, Gitanos in Spain, which is this whole different culture within a culture. Um, it's not only losing a home, but it's, it's being forced to be integrated into uh, what we call normal society. Um, so I wanted to, to document this process. Um, but then again, I was living in a different country and this process was really not uh, to be orchestrated. Uh, they didn't know, uh, they knew they were going to leave their house. Uh, we knew they were going to have within one or two years a letter uh, sent to their home. Uh, and then in the letter, uh, they, they were sent uh, an address, a key, and two days later, they, they would have to move their house. So something that was very difficult for us to control, uh, living in a, in a different country, of course, as well, but even living in, in Spain, uh, it's very difficult to be, to be there. So we were forced to think about a way, how can we still tell this story uh, without waiting for it, of, of course, as well. Um, uh, and, and then also some, some important moments of, of the film, for example, they have this town meeting where, um, where these uh, Red Cross uh, volunteers tell them, explain them to them, you will have to leave, this is the land has been sold. Those meetings happened in the past. So we had to recreate those and then on the, on the other hand also um, be a little bit, uh, yeah, how do you say? Um, uh represent the future like recreate the future how it could what we knew how it could happen so that's that's how we did it it's about sorry to interrupt you but tell me if i tell me if i'm wrong uh so what you're essentially saying is that you as a director you you like to work with non-professionals right so these are the people that because that's quite uh, explicitly um, written around your professional uh, actions and biographies. So you actually, in that film, we see what people would project they would feel in the future with this. Yeah, that's, that's I think, is really a very interesting. Um, it, was, um, it was really, sometimes time was um, going faster than we could uh, film it. And sometimes it was the other way. So actually, uh, when we filmed, uh, the last scene that they are actually leaving their house. Uh, it was also very strange for them because we emptied their house. Uh, we took everything and then after shooting the film, we put everything <laughs> back. But then two months later, only two months later, they actually got the letter uh, and they had to leave. And I've been asked many times, wasn't this traumatic for them to having to almost relive this twice uh, and I talked with them, of course, about this, this process, but the interesting thing is that they said that for them, it was a way to rethink this process. And instead of uh, being it only a negative, uh, thinking about it in a negative way, they almost by acting it took control of the situation. So they were prepared. So there was... Yeah. I, I wanted to just, just very quickly say that maybe it was even some kind of therapeutic process for them in a way to know yeah. 
what yeah. they've been going through. And this kind of practice does exist even in, yeah. in, in, in psychology in, in a different yeah. context. So it really is very interesting. And I hope that we will have another chance, Isabel, um, on, on other festival world, let's say, to, to, to discuss a bit more about that. Um, Evie, we've started talking because we were the first two uh, connecting to this, um, to this link. And I, it was very clear for me that the director of a film called Why Not You, um, co-production between Austria and Belgium, right? Is, um, you know, it's full of energy and there's something very strong and very honest about you that you, you, you connect uh, immediately. So that's great that I had the chance to chat with you a little bit. Um, I think what's, um, what's very interesting about this film when, uh, when the festival audiences will see it is also to, to look how you are entering this world of yeah, two young men, let's say at least the main, uh, the, 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 and the main character who is, um, who is um, male and the, it, and the story echoes to to um, let's say LGBTQI class issues, the gay thematic, but also to some extent the, the, the religious transformation and what happens to a person that is not allowed to the society where he maybe thinks he belongs and how then the person can be individually affected and where does it live? So it's really up to you to tell us what is what is the story of why not you and how, why did you decide to make it? Well, actually, why not you is only the international sales title. <laughs> the original <laughs> title is Hochwald. Okay. That, um, that's a place, um, um, in English, it would be High Forest. Um, but uh, it's a village in, um, it's a fictional village I created. And um, the the most important background, or let's say one of the main characters is Hochwald, is uh, High Forest. And um, while in this Hochwald, there live these two um, young boys, uh, one left already to have a career as an actor. The other wanted to go soon away to be a dancer. But as they are coming from different social backgrounds, um, yeah, they have um, different cards in their hand <laughs> for how to go on in their lives. And um, well, actually the winner went away as an actor at the end becomes, um, well, it's a tragedy ends his life. It's, uh, they got caught in an in a Islamic attack in a gay bar. Um, but I want to, to say something about what you said before about uh, gay issues and this and that. I didn't think uh, a second about uh, doing a movie, uh, um, a political correct movie about gays or Islam or religion or whatever. I just wanted to tell a story about a lost boy, about a boy who um, uh, is is not able to, to start a career, is not, uh, does not even know if he's talented enough, does not have the money to go away from this little village, from this community. Um, and this, uh, this, this main character brought me uh, to, to a modern story of our lives today. Yeah? That's a natural way to, to, to die nowadays in an, in an attack. Yeah? In if the movie uh, is in, in, in the 70s, what I was thinking also to do <laughs> to get out of this, uh, this Islamic topic, uh, it would be, I don't know, uh, an attack of Brigate Rosse, no? uh, the, um, how it's called, Red Brigade? I'm sorry, the, the, the terrorist, um, um, the terrorists of the 70s in Italy. And, um, well, the thing is that I think, I'm not so happy about uh, that now the movie is is so much in in this in this uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, context because I think sexuality in this movie is fluent like it is nowadays like it is uh, when I speak to young people they don't think so much about all this. Um, um, uh, 
I don't know, all these borders uh, we have, we discuss all, uh, discuss all day long. Yeah? Um, I think we should go on. And it's a modern Heimat film. Um, I, I don't know if you have this, it's an international genre, <laughs> but I think there are only Austrian movies done. It's a, it's a film about homeland and uh, um, of our modern homeland, especially uh, my homeland, uh, South Yeah, Germany. that's so interesting, Abby, what you're saying, because on uh, I, I completely understand that when you say, you know, it's a story of, of course, it is a story of a boy and it's set in, in the context, which is, which you know, and it evolves naturally and all these uh, elements being, um, LGBTQI or the the attack, as you mentioned, they are actually the current trends that we all live in our lives, right? So that's that's that actually, because that's how our life is. That that comes in the film naturally, because this is still what we are going through. That we can go in a club, be it a gay club or not, is not essential. I completely hear you there. Uh, but then we can be attacked by someone with uh, with some sort of a fundamentalistic views on things and our and the lives of young or old people are taken and that's obviously makes that charges i think your your film with the with the sense of some sort of a sense of urgency also on the societal level of what happens. We, we follow the story of the lost boy, as you said very warmly, who tries to, who has this passion for dancing and he, he dances inside of him all the time, right? But still there are so many barriers that he, he needs to overcome because these cards that you sat in his hands and in the hand of his friend who comes from different family right is much more on um more empowered let's put it that way then it's it's also different so uh while we're speaking there's been um a couple of weeks ago in here in, in Tbilisi in the capital of Georgia actually the church and the Georgian uh, uh governmental powers attacked uh actions of the young generation that were just, uh, you know, saying that uh, LGBTQI um, rights need to exist and many died in these attacks. So somehow what is taken as gender fluidity, because we see many people just being liberated from those uh, structures that existed below. Not, not everything is that easy in different territories. And I'm sure that in some countries here uh, that our directors feel this is quite a strong issue. And probably this is why sometimes when people see your film, they also see that element, but um, that's even better because different you know, different different viewpoints, broader discussion. Sure, but I mean, my yeah, my point of view was just to tell a modern story of what's going on nowadays in our lives. And uh, well, there there is gay people. There is not gay people. There is well, I mean, it's just yeah, it's wonderful. And you've been uh, you've been uh, awarded in this, I think you've been in this virtual festivaling cycle, right? With your film a lot somehow mm -hmm. uh, that we all ended up together. And um, it, it's, it's good that this um, so much warmth and so much care for the character is really, really seen through the film that you, you have in this program. I think we've got a message from Ninja who had to, who had to go. Uh, and for the, for, for the moment, the, the last but not least, someone who has not yet spoken is Robin from Denmark, uh, who's here with the documentary from the Wild Sea. And I wanted to somehow wrap with, with you, Robin, we're towards the end, because something, it's not about cultural boundary only and personal vision and so on. I think your film brings different urgency ringing bells and that is about sustainability climate change the the rights of anyone you know you, you'll tell better what your film is about <laughs> i think that it's an 
urgent call for, for the shared responsibility that we need to take everywhere, despite our origins and despite our citizenships and so on. And thank you very much for being so great on showing the perspective of animals in your film is just tremendous. It's, it's powerful, it's alarming, and I, I hope that many people will see the film and look at things from a different viewpoint. So what's coming from the wild sea and how did you cross this story? How did you account for, for this documentary chronicle, I mean? Um, no, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, I think one of the things that was important to me, because the film actually, first I should say that it follows uh, um, the process of rescuing marine animals, um, but it's not so much a film from this usual perspective that we're used to seeing, of a film from the animal's perspective, actually, as they are um, ex experiencing these rescue procedures. So, you can say that it's a film about wildlife rescue, but I think even more so it's a film um, that wants to just look at the world as a whole from a different perspective. And it's, 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 it's a, a huge invitation really to step into the world of someone else. And in this case, this world would be the world as it would be seen from a whale's perspective or a seal's perspective or a bird's perspective. So. So it's, it's a film that really plays on this, these different gazes, in a sense, um, and challenges this, this very human gaze. We've been talking about the male gaze, but there's also a human gaze on the world. We certainly see everything um, very much from our own perspective. And it's just so difficult to step out of that and, and kind of shake up your own world a little bit and and try to, to see things differently. So that's very much what it's about. It's, it's really a film on, on our coexistence with, with every other species in the world, um, just as much as it is a film about climate change. Um, because what, what we're seeing in the film is that those marine animals are really going through some terrible challenges nowadays with oil spills and, climate uh, in change induced storms and dolphins getting caught in fishing nets, all kinds of problems that are uh, largely man-made. So there is definitely this climate change perspective and this uh, human impact on the environment. Um, it's, it's a very strong issue in the film, you can say. Absolutely. And I think that somehow naturally, Abby and yourself been talking about this human perspective, the, 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 the wish of a human being without branding or placing someone in a special group. And you are talking about the perspective is just so literally unique, looking at things from the perspective of, of animals. And I think to some extent, um, this um, one hour and a half has been also um, anticipated in order to collect your visions to to see how you from where did you start navigating in the stories that are you, you are bringing to the program and what's your own take is on on your on your final films and I think we did probably achieve one thing only thanks to you all of you selected for this program is that you are all so diverse you are so different. You have such a different takes and visions and opinions that the only decision an audience could take is to just make a selection, check when are your films playing, in which festivals they can uh, catch them, if not in this reality, and just go out and learn about the beautiful stories that are, you are creating. There is one more person who's had to, who would be here. Uh, that's uh, Tuya from Finland. She is presenting a film called How to Kill a Cloud. But by the time um, we are speaking, her film is premiering in Locarno. And I think I would just use it as a, as a chance to say that cinema is alive. We are here on Zoom, but there've been a lot of premieres from summer onwards that are happening in person, that are physical, that people sometimes will probably have 
a crazy look after a film or a tear in the eyes, but basically the human celebration is cinema is back slowly but surely. So that's the only reason why Tuya couldn't be here with us. And otherwise we would very much like from your network perspective, thank you all for, for taking your time and joining the project. And I would pass back to Sonia um, to, to say the final goodbye for now, probably. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Tamara. And thank you really all for sharing this uh, with us. Um, so that lets us see the films. I wish for some of what you have said, I knew it before I saw the films, but now I have to, <laughs> I have to rework some of the films in my, in my mind. Thank you very much for participating. We are looking forward to promote you and your films continuously. And uh, yeah, I hope we will see uh, you soon again. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was nice yeah. to meet you. Good luck with your films. All the best to you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.